Welcome back to Write Off Rebuilds, episode two on the S1000 RR. We have got a massive pile of bits to fit. Today's aim is to get it, the last of the damaged bits off, all of the fresh panels back on, get it cleaned up, polished up, get it looking a bit more loved, a little bit less neglected, and uh, yeah, then look at options for paint and doing massive skids and wheelies. That's, that's the bit that's, that I'm focused on. I'm looking forward to that. One thing that was really cool after we posted the last episode was seeing the amount of interactions from everybody. Everybody has got something to say, an opinion or input or feedback about about rebuilding written off bikes, which I think is is really cool. Good and bad. There was <laughs> there's plenty of hurtful stuff in there as well, which I'll, I'll try not to take personally, but everyone's got something to say about this. There's a lot of people out there who've done it and, and do it regularly, who are in the same boat as us. There's a lot of people still that absolutely wouldn't do it and absolutely don't ever want to buy a written off bike which was i find interesting like i've always had bikes that have been written off and repaired that's kind of <laughs> how i've always done with motorbikes but yeah it's it's interesting to see some of the preconceptions people have about what that's going to mean for the bike hopefully we can show a few of these when we put this together and, and ride it and test it and make sure everything's straight that it's not always as as bad as it seems a few people said we paid too much money for it which i don't know we paid, like I said, under three grand it cost us, but that, that was part of a deal with Motormine with a big pile of parts to repair it as well. So I don't know, is it too much money? I think it depends what you want to do it for. If you want to buy one of these written off bikes and put it back together and sell it and make money, awesome. You're going to have to cut corners and repair panels and be a real skinflint with it because it's not a great way to make money. Otherwise, <laughs> the insurance companies would be doing it. However, if I'd gone out and spent five grand on S1000 RR, I'd have bought a finished bike, taken it home and ridden in it. And that would have been it as far as my relationship with that bike goes. This bike, I've bought home in bits looking really sorry for itself. And at the end of this project, I'll have touched every nut, every bolt, I'll have polished every panel, polished every bit of frame, and I'll have put it back together. And it will be my bike that I've built. And I love building bikes as much as I like riding them. So even if it costs the same, I'd still have a much better journey with this one than I would just buying one off the shelf. And I think that's the whole point. If you're doing this, it's because you love tinkering with motorbikes. And yeah, that's half the joy of it. So anyway, this episode, I'm gonna get into the long, boring cleaning bit, trying to make it look a little bit less neglected. And then the exciting bit of unboxing all that stuff and chucking it on the bike, getting it assembled and looking like a bike again. One thing I did wanna thank everyone for, the wonky rear sprocket. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a bike with a bent rear sprocket before. That is a, definitely a first for me. We spotted it when we were doing the edit. The Al phoned me up from Bike World and was like, you know the rear sprocket's knackered? And then everyone on, on the YouTube show chipped in and commented and let us know. But yeah, we've added a rear sprocket to the list of things to fix and that will be high up on the priorities. But yeah, just goes to show the weird things you can come across when you're buying a wrecked bike. Enough talking, spanners out, time to get greasy. So the last thing that's damaged that we've got to remove is the fuel tank. We have actually managed to source a replacement fuel tank, not in the right color, but eh, we'll deal with that later. But I'm going to get that fuel tank off and then set about cleaning all the crud and neglect and grime off this beautiful motorcycle. Oh, lots of fuel in there. That is profit. Ugh. I noticed this bike was actually pretty minging underneath it just a bit of corrosion here and there quite dirty just generally quite dirty we've just pulled the tank off and under the tank again it's just minging in there there's like a thick layer of of grime on absolutely everything um i could try and spend hours and hours and hours polishing it off with a cloth but at this point what i'm going to do is i'm going to wheel it outside i've got a small handheld pressure washer that's a little bit less angry than my big pressure washer so I'm gonna get a load of degreaser in it, a load of cleaner and blast it off. To do that, obviously I need to make sure I'm not putting water anywhere it shouldn't be. I've secured the end of the fuel pipe, so I've got a little zip tied bag over there so I can't get any water down the fuel line. And then what I've, I'll do is I'll make sure as I finish cleaning, I'll blast all the connectors, all the bits out with a little airline so I can make sure the water's cleared out of everywhere. Big heater next to it, dehumidifier, and just make sure it dries out properly so we don't get any corrosion problems. But I think that's gonna be the best way to get this thing actually looking nice again. Because right now, it is covered in spider webs and a bit rank. Right, we've given it a good old wash with its clothes off. So just using the airline to blast out 
any water from inside connectors and stuff mainly because the bike's going to sit here for a while and i don't want it to get in there and corrode there's always the argument that using this blasts the water further in but my view is that if this can blast it further in it was going to get in there anyway this should do more good than harm and yeah i just want to make a nice spray noise So if you watched the last one, you'll remember at the very end, we sent the oil from this bike away from analysis. It's a service that you can get done basically on your oil and check what condition your engine's in. An engine that's got issues, that's got wear that's about to go, will start to contaminate its oil, whether that's with sort of metals, aluminium, brass, phosphor, that sort of thing from the bushes in the engine, or from excess fuel going in there or other issues. That stuff can all be identified just by looking at the oil. It's something that in military and industry applications is absolutely normal. You know, in, in military vehicles, the oil's sampled regularly, and then they know, sometimes too late, that if they get it done in time, they know that that engine's got an issue and they can change it before it fails in service. In this case, we used the motor oil analysis service for this bike. It costs 40 quid for a sample pack. Is it something you're gonna do on your normal road bike between rides? No, absolutely not. It's sort of thing that on a race bike or a competition bike or a bike with an unknown past, it's not a bad thing to do. And if you've got that nagging feeling like, oh, sounds like there's a rattle or there's a top end knock or there's a graunchy bottom end for my bike, for 40 quid you send an analysis away and you, you get an answer. You get a, a bit of a heads up as to what's going on. The one that we sent for this bike came back as A-OK. -okay. No excessive contaminants in the oil whatsoever, which is a really good thing. It's worth doing, I think, with a, a bike of unknown origin and a bike that's been crashed, because if this thing's gone down on its side and the throttle's been wound open, it'll run that engine with no oil pickup, and that can damage the engine. So for a crashed bike, it's always a good thing to check. And if you're gonna build a race bike or build a, a special or a tuner bike, it gives you a good idea of where your engine's at before you start spending money on it. Now, in terms of re-oiling this engine, I'm gonna chuck some fresh oil and filter in it anyway. Motul have sent us this which is ngen 7 this is actually regenerated oil which probably along with you lot out there on the internet watching this i was very very uh cynical about because this is recycled oil would you want to put recycled oil in your motorcycle well my answer the more i think about it is actually why not you know motors a massive company they're not gonna they're not gonna start making and supplying oils that are gonna damage your engine because <laughs> they wouldn't they'd go bankrupt for the lawsuit so they've made this all but 50 percent of it is from recycled high quality oil and then the other 50 percent is your usual additives virgin oils and magic stuff it says there on the label so i mean i'm going to give it a try i'm keen to put it in there motor aren't going to sell something that is going to damage your engine would i use it on a fully highly strung super tuned drag race or race bike I'm not sure. It's definitely something I want to speak to Motul about and get some more information on. But for this road bike, the fact that we're regenerating a bike, we're bringing a bike back from written off, seems nice to use some regenerated oil as well. And not only can we do 190 horsepower wheelies, we can also keep the dolphins happy. Everybody wins. Right, so we've got a few bits where we're transferring stuff off the old bits onto the new bits. So the fuel tank, I need to transfer over the filler cap because that lock set matches the key to the bike and likewise the pillion seat our pillion seats trashed um, could have got that recovered but it was cheaper and easier and quicker to get a replacement seat but again there's a there's a lock built into the pillion seat on these so i need to swap that lock over so i keep the same standard lock set with the bike as i'm going through all the new bits i'm just giving everything a little bit of clean so i've got my best polishing pants out i'm going to give everything a little bit of a clean so anything that i put back on the bike goes on clean shiny and ready to go so the colour situation on the bike, I'd kind of hope we were going to get lucky and find a bunch of panels in the same standard colour as the bike is, but we haven't, <laughs> is, the, is the long and the short of it. The champagne-y, goldy, silvery colour doesn't seem super common. Um, a lot of white stuff around, a lot of the black stuff and quite a few of that kind of lurid acid yellow colours. So we've kind of got what we've got. So I've got a black fuel tank. I've got white seat unit. 
and uh, Luma, or the sort of bright yellow acid yellow side panel. So currently <laughs> we've got a yellow, silver, black and white S1000 <laughs> Um Yeah, watch this space. I'm going to work out what to do that. We're either going to paint some of the panels to match our favourite colour out of the others in the standard colour or we'll just get a wrap or a, a respray done. I think I'm leaning towards I'm leaning towards a wrap to make it look a bit cool and a bit different. But yeah, open to suggestions. Fuel tank fitment on. I want to get it on and get it pressurized, make sure there's no leaks, make sure the pump still works. Now I've faffed with all the wiring. It will all be coming back off at some point to, to get painted or wrapped or whatever we decide. Yuck, years of cake tongue grime. That's better, a bit cleaner. Yep, yep, I am chiseling tarmac out the end of a handlebar. That must have corked a hole in the road, that. But um, I know, technically, there's no point in putting the new handlebar weights on yet because there's a million other things to do. But I've got some shiny stuff, and I want to cheer myself up from all the hours of cleaning by putting some shiny bits on. Now, pretty hefty, these bar end sliders, but it's good for crash. And they're also weighted to be a similar weight to the original ones because the weight of your bar end weights is, has a big effect on how much vibration you get up the handlebars. So not, not changing that is a good idea if you want to ride it on the road. Nice. Oh, this is exciting. This is gonna give the bike the appearance of being a bike again. One of these must do my rear light and let's pop that up in there. Oh, it's got a bum. It's got a bum again. I think that's the rear light. Pillion seat goes back on. Let's check the lock all works properly. Yes. Seat on. That's gonna look like a motorbike again. Ha! Ah! Basically finished, isn't it? You could almost ride it like that. So that has been a pretty productive day. We are slowly ending up with a, uh, a Technicolor Rainbow <laughs> S1000RR, especially once I find the luminous yellow side panel that goes on it. Just going to tick away, keeping going on the rest of the bodywork, polishing and cleaning as we go. Then we've got a few big things to sort out. One is paint, wrap, colour scheme, whatever we're going to do with that. That, that is a, a, big, a big job next. Then tyres, a little bit of a service. And there's a couple of panels we're still missing. So I'm still missing a cockpit. I've got to buy one side of the cockpit fairing because that's cracked. Um, but the price new from BMW isn't too bad on that. So I'm probably going to buy a new one. Same with this subframe. I've got to get a new subframe because it's just split across the top. I could probably straighten it and weld it. But again, a, a new one's not that expensive. I think it was something like 60 or 70 quid. So I think I'm going to go for a new subframe. And of course, the... Uh, the infamous sprocket that's bent, so we'll stick a chain the sprockets on as well. But yeah, good progress today and tantalizingly close now to having a bike that not just makes a broom noise, but we'll able to do skids and wheelies again. Uh-oh. <laughs>